welcome to another exciting episode of Humanity 8.0, a podcast where we talk about our post-truth present and our transhuman future, with the aim of sketching out the outlines of what awaits us in the years and the decades ahead of us. This podcast is brought to you by Rokos. Companies with limited IT budgets and personnel can now get the same cybersecurity protection as big enterprises. Rokos's Secure Access Service Edge, SASE solution, with zero trust, provides enterprise-grade comprehensive cybersecurity so that you can focus on your business. For more, please visit www.rokos.com. That's R-O-Q-O-S.com. And now, here's your host, Dr. Ahmed Bouzid, founder and CEO of Witlingo. Yeah, right. let, me pick it back, let me pick it back on that one uh, so that we can go and play our respective parts there that I alluded to at the beginning, which is mm. um, Erasmus, Professor Fuller, you believe that we need to work within the university to sort of sh um, shape it so that it will go back to that role. Uh, you believe that that role um, is important, notwithstanding all these innovations, right? Um, so let's, let's put that cap on you. And then, Michael, I think I'm probably unfairly put a cap on uh, of you, the guy who just wants to go and radically reform it from outside as opposed from within. Um, perhaps, um, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't be too sorry if you just went away. Uh, <laughs> so let me just create this character okay. to, uh, to yeah. get the... Well, well, I think one of the key things between Erasmus and Luther um, is, is this idea of disintermediating you know, these interpreters of the Bible or, you know, people who stand between you and God mm -hmm. and, and the Reformation is, is, is really a radical, you know, decentralization of some of these questions of faith. And, and then maybe that spilled over into, into other areas of inquiry as well. And so I wonder in this landscape that Steve just uh, depicted where um, universities are trying to compete with Aristotle in my pocket on my smartphone, um, what emerges. Um, so I, I agree that uh, I don't think we're going to have like a, a, you know, in the United States, there aren't going to be 300 million people with Aristotle in their pocket who are pursuing knowledge. Um, I think they're the, the few that are even, I think they're still going to reach for human to human interactions based on this, this reason of embodiment and charisma that we've been talking about. And we may see emerge, what I would say is maybe not within the university itself, but someone like Steve could splinter off, especially in fields that are more in the humanities. And there's no reason why someone couldn't, you know, form their own new academy in a sense where it, it instead of being a faculty at a big university, it's it's something much smaller and, and people are gravitating to it. And, and the reason people will go to that is because they are drawn by the attractiveness of, of, of learning at the feet of the master. And they know with good certainty that they can pick up the skills they need to survive in the labor market elsewhere, rather than like mm -hmm. trying to pack it all into one, one degree at the university. So I do think that decentralization as Luther sort of, as the Luther theme, uh, I think, I think that's what I would, would predict. Yeah. And Steve, how would you, how would you go about uh, reforming the university? Because I think that's what Well, first thing I would yeah. say and is that I think one of the consequences of reforming the university will be that there won't be so many of them. OK, and so maybe um, it, so, so in this way, I sort of tack a bit toward Michael. Uh, I actually would like to see a sort of um, pricking of the financial bubble of the university with a lot of these institutions going out of business. I would really like to see that. And in a sense, in many cases, returning to what their original business was, because, of course, one of the reasons why we have so many universities across the world now is a lot of them have been scaled up from being uh, technical colleges right? Vocational schools, mm -hmm. things like that. And they probably are better suited to being that, right? To go back to that original status. Um, and, and, and so this would be kind of my general view. My general view is that, that if this Humboldtian 2.0 thing uh, takes off, it will not be, be because every university will be doing this by no means. In fact, it'll be a kind of um, a sort of culling moment, mm -hmm. It will be a culling moment where where there will be a few institutions and, and you know, probably the institutions you would expect in a way um, who would actually embrace this more fully and in a sense would recede from the promises about offering 
you know, credentials and jobs and stuff like that, which universities increasingly cannot fulfill no matter what the quality is. Uh, right. and, and so um, I think that's kind of what I'm, I'm looking for here. Uh, I, I'm not looking for a complete reform of the uh, entire university system. I think, I think rather the university system will implode. So in this sense, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, in this sense, Just I am closer. To, <laughs> yeah, I'm closer to Michael on this. I think it's, you know, it's unsustainable. It's financial. I mean, we have any, you know, I mean, you know, Michael talks about this uh, about the yeah. issue of how much money it costs and what do you get in return. Well, let me and, ask. Let me ask you that. Why? Why? Um, I think healthcare and like sort of the most fundamental things we need is like our health and our or uh, education. Um, why are they the one? Why has the cost spiked so much over the years? What explains that? Even even though there's a proliferation of universities, everybody's going yeah. to think that the, the, the economics would have it where the competition would be such that the prices would go down. But why are tuitions have gone up and spiked up? You know, continuously since I don't know since the early seventies. Well, but I, there is a. Uh... Go, I mean, I mean, in the actually, I would say that the United States is actually relatively okay on this because it has mm -hmm. a spread. It has an enormous spread mm -hmm. of institutions, mm -hmm. right, which charge varying amounts. Mm -hmm. Of course, you mm -hmm. get what you pay for, kind of thing. I mean, sure. there's there's that aspect to it. Sure. Um, sure. But but it's it, and and in the case of in, in the case of Europe, of course. Um, you know the stuff. You know there there are some lids placed on the uh, you know some some caps placed mm. on the uh, mm. on the funding, uh, but that's largely through taxation. But there's increasing um, economic pressure to sort of take a lid off that, right? And again, you'd end up getting this system where then universities would be able to charge as much as they want. But I think a lot of it's just hype. I mean, I think a lot of yeah. it is hype. I, I I think there's a sense mm. in which universities actually deceive people <laughs> right in, in terms of their advertising right. right and maybe and maybe it's because they've deceived themselves but they can, i mean they can't actually guarantee a lot of the stuff that they're they're, they're claiming to right i mean i mean yeah. uh, you know especially when it comes to things like getting jobs mm -hmm. uh, and you know and and so I yeah, think even law schools for the, you. You would think even a vocational school like yeah. law school, they'd be. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, I just prepare you. To, to be honest with you, I think uh, you know, if I were someone who wanted to take down the university, I would be funding lawsuits, right? <laughs> you lost yeah. uh, um, mm -hmm. a, a, a wide range of lawsuits from from disgruntled students and yes. parents and alumni, and just throw it at you know, keep Absolutely. universities in the courts. Uh, and 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 that would also keep them keep the universities in in the headlines, and that would create a real strong general call for reform of the system. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree yeah. because right. I mean, there's always this debate about student debt, yep. and while I can feel some sympathy and compassion for the people who were ripped off, what's weird is this debate seems to center on hey, let's pay off the debt, and then no one seems to care or talk about well, More wait a second. Time. What? Yeah. Why? And what are we going to do five years from now when the same situation happens? Exactly. Like, look at the universities. It's like the universities are the are the, are the culprit here. Why don't we focus on that? Um, uh, let me let me ask you. And, and and I should I want to emphasize that the universities are quite complicit in this. They're not be. Mm. I, I even though there are all these pressures on the university. Mm. If you look at university administrators and the people who run universities, they have openly gotten themselves into this. Yeah. Okay, they have they they have you know they have dr drunk from the poison chalice, right, right? Of the knowledge economy and so forth. They are the biggest boosters, the biggest promoters. Oh, they don't yeah. need that much. They don't need that much nudging from the government or the business sector, right? Uh, I mean, mm. this is the problem. The problem is that the university leaders are really complicit here mm -hmm. yeah yeah yep. i think there are others you, you could see with healthcare you mentioned i mean there, there are regulations there are limits about who can count as a university you know the mm. accreditation process it limits competition the government is subsidizing it just tons of money pouring in you look at every time the government will offer either more grants or financial aid or loan backing it's like every time they do that the universities just raise the price by that amount yeah. Okay, we're going to give you four thousand dollars in student aid and federal aid. Okay, the university raises tuition four thousand dollars. So, um, I think the economics of the situation just haven't been great either in terms of you know just what what are the basic conditions for innovation and and competition. 
So how would you go about making a, you know, like changing? Let's say, for example, we do want to go to a place where um, we have fewer universities and those universities are, in fact, creating um, full human beings who are going to be healthy in terms of being curious and, you know, and all that. Um, how do we go from, from here to there, um, given, given all these real pressures and given that the economic system is, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a Marxist in a sense, right? It's, it's mm. from the bottom up. I mean, uh, it, it feels to me that university is not the dog, it's a tail, and the dog is wagging it, and, and it, it is doing what it does within this ecosystem of, you know, uh, folks trying to compete, like the 9.9% where uh, where I reside, right, versus 0.1% versus 90%. That 9.9% was not going to gamble gamble the their 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 kids career by not having them go to college mm -hmm. they will go to college they will take the sats to go to college they'll go to the best college possible and they will get them tutors and they will get that degree um and then whether they'll get a job or not is like okay <laughs> but how do you how do you how do you go about making that change i mean are you, you start from the middle by educating folks the parents or do you start yeah. from the bottom you start from the top from the university how would you go about making I think, you know, I'll jump in quick yeah. with some like the really boring ideas that I think would go a long way are policy oriented. So mm -hmm. in the United States, we're start, starting to see this is do not requiring a, a bachelor degree for government jobs. Where in the past too, some of these jobs, there's no way they needed a bachelor degree. So, you know, cops walking the beat or, you know, some functionary in a bureaucracy, it should be perfectly fine if someone has the skills to get that job. And so, yeah, part of the demand for these college degrees are just like these requirements that are out there from the government, uh, you know, even in, into the private sector. Um, but if, if you, you know, make a tweak like that, I think it could go a long way. But let me, in, let me, let me just challenge you there. Right. Yeah. Um, so a tweak. Okay. So I'm a manager, right. I work mm -hmm. in the government. I get resumes. I need to fill a spot. I got 10 resumes in front of me. Um, like right. eight of them have bachelor degrees and two don't. You think I'm going to take a risk and risk my career? Because no, I'm look, no, 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 no. What Michael's talking about, because I, 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 he's right. Uh, I mean, sure. what he's talking about is that the certification process for jobs needs to be devolved to the place of employment, mm -hmm. right? The right. university should not provide some kind of all-purpose certification process. No, I understand. I mean, I understand. It, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. The point is that the, I mean, I, economists always talk about the universities as providing kind of market signals, right? Uh, yeah. they, they shouldn't take that role so literally. I mean, it seems to me that 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 in fact, you know, if you're a government, you know, a government administrator trying to hire someone, mm -hmm. you should know if you're competent, what exactly is required for the job and then develop some kind of yeah, test or right. interviews yeah. protocol or something by which you can then sort out candidates. If you well, can't do that, if you need well, and then, if you and need then Right. And apprenticeships. So exactly. Or, or I mean, some kind of training things. process. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, what I'm what I'm trying to get at, really, and I, I totally understand that. Uh, I'm just saying that this person, right, they may know actually how to do all of that, how to create mm. the program, but they're afraid. I mean, like we talked about it before, Steve, you and I, right. about risk, right? People don't want to take risks. So yes. bring it it's, it's, risk. it's cover your ass thinking. Like, ass. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not advocating it. I'm just pointing it out. You go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, no, people do it. It's like the, the, the famous example is no one got fired for exactly M or whatever, right? So exactly. No one ever got fired for hiring this Harvard grad. That's right. right. <laughs> you know, okay, he he ended up blowing up that division of the company, but yeah, I made a good choice because he went to Harvard. I I do think yeah, but, maybe one yeah. element is we need uh, is that I think there is mimesis in society, uh, and and we need mm -hmm. elite uh imitation where maybe maybe there are a number of people who start to live yeah. you know extraordinary lives or even just you know fulfilling and, and they have fulfilling and successful careers but it doesn't involve let's say yeah. going through the the top 30 schools yeah. in, in the US news and world report it, it yeah. it's something else and i think you know based on my work i know it's a very very small like slice of of the world right now, but yeah, trying to support people who don't have degrees to to launch their careers, I think, is important. And maybe if they are, I mean, they could be as big as someone like you know Mark Zuckerberg, let's say. But I think we could, if we if we just have more and more successful lives out there that embody 
a way of life that does not involve, you know, participating yeah. in this yeah. Leviathan system. <clears throat> and I think that'll go a long way so, yeah. so that it will be the case that, okay, you are the senior manager of this bureaucracy in Washington, DC, and you have five candidates. And then whatever that alternative that emerges, you will, ha that will be in competition with the diploma from, yeah. you know, New York University or wherever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, which is very humble in the sense that you're creating exemplars, people that people people can look yeah. up to, right? Um, right. Here's a guy, here's, here are people who, I remember in the, in the late 90s, by the way, when there was the internet bubble, right, where it was crazy. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Uh, I remember mm -hmm. in, I remember venture capitalists, probably Michael, you were a little kid back then. <laughs> but I, I remember venture capital venture capitalists uh, you know during uh, four or five years, they would not look at you uh, unless you were you're like completely you know in the margin. like yes, I remember I don't know if you remember that, but I remember di distinctly if you have a degree, or, or or if you went to Harvard or MIT, no, you are in the mainstream because you were thinking, you know, two point <laughs> oh. It lasted like four or five years, and then we went back yeah. to. <laughs> um, hopefully, somebody's going to write about that particular aspect of it, where people were looking for the outliers. I think there's something about that in your book, Michael. Actually, well, yeah, I mean, there is. I think yeah. people will start to pattern match to yeah. recent yeah. stories. So I think Elizabeth Holmes, that whole disaster, could yeah. be somewhat explained by That's... the mix of these two things. So it's <laughs> like right. she went to Stanford, but she dropped out. She yeah. uh, dressed like Steve Jobs. She, she, she sent the right signals. Yeah. Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and those investors were fooled. One mm -hmm. of the overlooked aspects of that story that I don't think is emphasized enough is that the, the investors who were duped were not actually great investors in, right. in the world of Silicon Valley. A lot of them were more like families or prominent yeah. people. Yeah. Not you know the skilled practitioner. That's right. I remember Bill Clinton liked her. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and Kissinger. And yeah, yeah, Schultz. yeah. All those, all those great <laughs> financial minds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that that does happen. Um, yeah. <laughs> let me let me take. Uh, but what, can I just, go ahead? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Jump in on on, mm -hmm. on this because, I, I mean, in in very mundane ways already there is a kind of. Um, the valuation of, of, of degrees taking place. So I'll give you, mm -hmm. so in the UK where I live now, um, you know, so for example, the major accounting firms, you know, PricewaterhouseCooper, all these places, uh, they don't actually require degrees anymore for, for their accountants. They have their own kind of in-house tests and interview system. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and this is true also of a lot of the, the major uh, newspapers and magazines in the UK. Um, right, where they have their own quality, you know, they have their own kind of certification. Also, and Google, them, I think Microsoft for for coding. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, and 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 uh, also uh, some of these places also have apprenticeships, as Michael was suggesting. Yeah. Um, so if you're not quite there yet, but you seem to have the potential based on the initial thing, they'll kind of draw you and they'll they'll take the risk, as it were, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's a really healthy aspect of this kind of move that's taking place. Yeah. Is that the employer takes the risk on this and it doesn't offload it to universities that are right. really competent in handling it okay yeah. um and um, and and one other indicator which which happened in the last couple of years in the uk is that um it used to be that if you got a law degree in the uk you would have a kind of fast track to being able to get certified as a practicing lawyer mm. uh, but that stopped okay mm -hmm. and so now mm. law degree in the uk has to be pursued as a purely academic subject and then there's a totally separate process because mm. that separate process is now open to people from all kinds of backgrounds mm -hmm. right so in other words it gets so it, it, it's going back to kind of the old days yeah. of yeah. how you became a lawyer right before there were before there was this kind of automatic connection between law schools and certification it's now kind of an independent process in the uk and i think mm. so you're beginning to see this kind of credential rollback Right, that's right. beginning to take place across many different fields um and um, and i, I and my guess is yeah. this we, is going to carry on in many different ways yeah, yeah. Because we, we see that with engineering for sure yeah. um and and i think it, it is related to some of these jobs where you can actually measure how good mm -hmm. someone is yep. that's thing directly so mm -hmm. with engineering computer engineering either you can build things or you can't and there are lots of people now who come out of these uh boot camps and you know, yep. these independent coding schools and so on, and they're getting jobs at Amazon and Google and so on. Those companies don't care a whit. Um, yeah. In fact, there's a website called GitHub. It's a repository of code. Mm -hmm. And people, in essence, upload the projects that they've worked on, and it becomes this portfolio. Yep. That's, that's part of your resume. No. Yeah. yeah. And that is more 
uh, yeah. useful in getting a job in those industries than having a LinkedIn or a resume. Yeah. No, like I can you, tell you. Yeah, yeah you could be a pseudonymous avatar, Darth Vader, but your code <laughs> is like five okay. stars. <laughs> exactly. You'll be hired by. <laughs> no, I, I, I exactly. I mean, that's a space and I hire uh, coders. And I don't, I never look at their degrees. I just look at their GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> and then an interview, right. you can tell exactly. Um, so let me take a, uh, what I think is perhaps an interesting twist, perhaps not, right? Which mm -hmm. is the following. Do we, do you guys agree that perhaps a military academy today that um, produces officers is perhaps closer to where we want the university to be? Because they want to have a full human being uh, who think, who, and, they, and they, they take actually, they take art and philosophy and all that very seriously. I remember during the Iraq war, I think uh, it was the, um, the Pentagon, they said, everybody has to watch the Battle of Algiers, right? Right? Uh, <laughs> because, yeah. Um, but what do you think about that thought, right? The military academies think, thinking about creating human beings, which is, I think, what they involve. Huh. Jeez, I can't speak to other countries. All I will say, and I don't know, and it could be the influence <laughs> of the military and politics, it mm -hmm. seems like we are creating a very uh, competent uh, soldier class. Mm -hmm. And yet we've lost, you know, eight of the last nine wars. We've been involved in just on, you know, unjust wars or wars that spiral out of control and destabilize regions. I mean, it's just an embarrassment. So in some sense, it's like on the tactical level, maybe the graduates of West Point and Annapolis are upstanding people and, and you know, are well, well they're not the ones who decide policy. It's like the Rumsfeld. Well, that's the thing, though. You know, like, you know the idiots out there, <laughs> or George Bush, who thinks that right. by invading a country, you can whatever. Um, but I mean, what do you think? Do you think that uh, it's closer? To I, I think there's something to this. Let me let me just say, I think there's something to what you're saying. Um, um, uh, I, you know, I, I do. I have a I have a friend who actually has uh, who has uh, nie nie nieces and nephews who went to West Point. Mm. Uh, and, um, <laughs> and 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 she's very impressed by what, you know, what they produced of these people. Um, mm. And and I think uh, and, and this does go. I mean. So when you think about Humboldt, okay, mm -hmm. um, I think one person you should think alongside of Humboldt to sort of get this kind of connection you're making is uh, Clausewitz. Yes, uh, I Carl have one. Clausewitz, uh, right, have, who is a contemporary, <laughs> um, is, and, uh, and I think is very much along the same mm. uh, wavelength of thinking. Um, and, and again, you have to imagine that the, uh, the Humboldtian University was part of a nation building mm. project in the general sense. This is what made prima facie persuasive uh, to the Prussians. Um, and so it was about a kind of training of leaders of tomorrow. I mean, I think that's very clear. And in fact, it was recruited and the people who were recruited for these universities came from all walks of life. And there was an examination mm -hmm. system and so forth that was involved. Um, and, and these people were made to, you know, self-present as people who could, you know, participate in public life and be leaders and so forth. Um, and this is very much like, I would say, officer training, mm -hmm. right, of a certain kind, uh, especially of a very well-rounded kind, right? And, and, and of course, the interesting thing about military education is it has a very strong physical component uh, yep. in terms yep. of, component, uh, of comportment and stuff yep. like that. Health, yes. Um, and, and, and so, um, and Humboldt did, uh, in a way, appreciate, you might say, that sort of Greco-Roman kind mm -hmm. of backdrop. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. of the academy, which also had this kind of thing. Um, so I don't think this is so far-fetched. I think there is a sense. Yeah, no, okay. So I'll, I'll take a different tack, which is um, the people who seem most successful at this now, at creating a small little academy, mm. are actually like these Navy SEAL guys mm. or you know, special forces where Jocko Willink has a podcast. He talks about leadership. He educates on leadership. He educates on health. He educates on fitness. And his following is just a, a, astonishing. So maybe it's it's not necessarily Annapolis, yeah. like something that bears that strong resemblance to yeah. the current university. But maybe we're going to start to see the whoever the elite are who combine body, mind, heart. Uh, you know, obviously Willick doesn't lecture on you know War and Peace or Dostoevsky, but but maybe that type of person will emerge, and the, and 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 that you know their students will be as well-rounded as you're saying. Well, you yeah. know, the, I mean, and of course, if you go down the Leo Strauss route, 
you know, Harvey <laughs> Mansfield and John Silver yeah. and all these people who like to sort of trump up the uh, mm -hmm. the, the implicit militarism of the mm -hmm. Plato ethic, the Plato <laughs> Academy, right? I right. mean, uh, so there is a there is a certain kind of strand there waiting in the wings that one could <laughs> refer to as well. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I don't know. Are you, are you familiar with what? what I mean, I'm sure Michael's familiar with this, but are you familiar with this, Ahmed? I mean, that there yeah. is a certain way of thinking about Plato, right? That That's emphasizes right. Yep. the martial. Well, that, that he, he, yes, he was too much an admirer of Sparta. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. yeah. Well, the question that really I'm, I'm getting at really is, is, um, can can we can we have a version of the military school that is completely civilian? I mean, we used to have it way back, right? But somebody, mm -hmm. um, which is it goes back to your project, right, Steve? Which is, can we create, um, you know, a place where somebody can go and at the end of four years or whatever, um, they they come out as somebody who has skills, but also is a full on human being who knows how to learn, for example, and how to deal with people, how to grow, and how to deal with, uh, take care of themselves in terms of their uh, and all that, right? Um. And I guess what I'm seeing here is uh, my world. In my world, I see influencers. I see knowledge in YouTube. I see, you know, universities. And I see all this ecosystem where it's up to me really, right, on how I was raised by my parents, whether I'm going to go the right way or not, right? Because I have, a ch I have choices, right? Um, but the question is, how does one in their teen years, um, how does one, how is one primed to go ahead and become the learner that they need to be to become the full human being they need to be like is it is it is it religion is it uh what is it? Is it tradition how how does one get primed by by what because it seems to me that that is the pivot point aside from the structural changes you guys are talking about does that make sense wow i mean yes yeah. it does i mean i, <laughs> I mean i, I question yeah the, the, I mean, do you want to begin, Michael? Or should I begin? Maybe, <laughs> no, you maybe go for you, it. You jump in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, because um, so I'm so uh, you know, I'll just speak from my own experience about this because I I don't have any kind of general answer. Uh, <laughs> I have to say uh, that that my my parents, especially my mother, um, was very keen um, on my becoming this kind of person that we're talking about. Mm. Um, and and she had a basically a two pronged strategy, uh, which I think worked for me. Um, one was she gave she actually uh, gave me a lot of time and space to myself and encouraged me to uh, go to bookshops and browse around and stuff like that. It mm -hmm. sounds like a pretty simple thing, uh, but but you know, and and also encouraged me to go to art museums and stuff like that. I live in I, I'm from New York City originally, and so that was pretty easy. All of that stuff mm -hmm. was kind of available, you might say, yeah. uh, in a pretty easy way. Um, and also, I was um, I was trained by the Jesuits until I went to university. Uh, and and the Jesuits are all about what we're talking about here. And of course, the Jesuits, the founder of the Jesuit order of the Catholic Church, Ignatius Loyola, was a military guy. Okay, mm. um, and and the whole Jesuit uh, framework is about being a sort of whole person for God kind of thing, uh, and as it were to uh, encourage you know, and by example. Right to actually encourage people to, in in their case, because the Jesuit order was founded to combat the Protestant Reformation. Right, that's an important point about the history of the order, um, and and so is in the exam, you know, the exemplar that was presented by the Jesuit priest. Right, uh, Christians would be persuaded to stay in Catholicism rather than defect to Calvin or Luther. Right, that was mm -hmm. kind of the pre pretext, mm -hmm. and and so part of the education that I had um, was very heavily you know, biased, uh, you might say, toward rhetorical things. Um, so having to uh, recite poetry, enact plays, uh, give speeches, mm -hmm. some of them ex extemporaneous, debate, right? Um, so the self-presentation aspect of education uh, was very much in the forefront, you know, kind of classical liberal arts in that sense, right? Where you're training the person to perform, right? And so, and that was very integral you know, even with, when we were dealing with mathematics and stuff like that, right? I mean, you know, subjects that you might regard as somewhat detached from performance. Uh, and, um, and, and so that's my own personal history, actually. So, the, so in a sense, you know, for me, you know, in, invoking Humboldt seems quite a natural way to go and seems to be quite the, the, the natural, as, you know, the natural way in which universities and, you know, mm -hmm. education ought to proceed. And, and so the whole idea of uh, educating people to acquire 
specific job related skills or knowledge or expertise seems to me the foreign notion, seems to me the alien notion, uh, the one that in some sense cuts against education and mm-hmm. is in, in, in effect uh, performing some other kind of function. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of in a way, my, so that in a way makes it easy, at least for me, yep. you might say psychologically, to get yep. into this subject. Because I don't right. take the expertise approach to knowledge for granted. Yeah. I think it's, in fact, a deformation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael, what, what, what are your thoughts? on? <clears throat> yeah, maybe just going back to this. Um, it's interesting that you bring up the uh, Annapolis example. And I'm thinking of that got me thinking about just people's general health. And then I start thinking about, wait a second. That's like a, a great example of how bad education is. Uh, K through 12 and then maybe university. Uh, in, in terms of how do we improve people's fitness and health? Mm-hmm. Not everyone has to become a marathon runner or you know sports <laughs> athlete. That quite good habits. Think, yeah. But if you think a gym class, I can't Mm-mm. think of a more useless oh. waste of an hour or ninety minutes where I we did nothing in gym class and did nothing to, yeah. to pass on knowledge about how I might you know stay in shape or whatever. <laughs> and then I contrast that with you know people who it comes back to the point of embodiment and charisma and being in person is like the people who do join the jujitsu dojo and they have this master who just like mm-hmm. not only teaches them techniques, but like teaches embodies a way of life. And that can be tremendously powerful. So maybe the future uh, of that education will, will change. Too, well, how did you, how did you, I'm sorry, how did you get to this point? Meaning how, what made you who you are? Well, because you were saying something about like, yeah. Hey, people who no. aren't only learning in the mind, but also, also in the body and i was like oh my god well yeah the current system like no one yeah. cares about no i'm saying body. you as michael uh, gibson uh, uh, the person who, yeah um just as we heard from steve um right what is your story how did you get to this point where you oh you- yeah i think uh you know i didn't i and i talk about this a little bit my personal life in the book is like yeah. i i I grew up thinking one person was my dad and discovered, you know, when I was 20, someone else was. And, and part of that was like the dawning in my mind is like, I grew up in a house that didn't really read a lot. I grew Mm -hmm. up in a house that didn't have a lot of books. Now my biological father, it turned out was the type of person who had tons of books and uh, you know, records because he was involved a little bit with music and and stuff. And, and so I had to discover that life Mm. for myself. And I, it it, like, not that I have regrets, but it's interesting, like maybe why it took me so long to get interested in things is because I was growing up in a situation where it was not necessarily, it, it wasn't discouraged, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't promoted yeah. to, to hang out in bookshops. So it wasn't until I uh, moved to New York city, I went to NYU and the school, okay. It did expose me to some ideas, but just the fact that there were all these bookshops, that's what stuck out Steve's story where I resonated. It was like, I just became a bookshop rat and mm-hmm. I would spend all my money on books I, I graduated. I, I was in grad school. I remember one of the the first things. Um, so I I, I was a j- journalist for Tech Review, which is this magazine MIT owns. And at that time, there before Obamacare, there was Romney Care. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Mitt Romney was governor of Massachusetts, Massachusetts yeah. and it had the same individual mandate. So as a young guy, I was like, I'm I'm healthy. I need that. 3000 bucks to buy books. So I got the exception <laughs> from Romney care. I was like, I don't want this coverage. I'm spending this That's money on great. books. <laughs> well, it's good to know who you are, right? Uh, so you know what to spend the money to get. Well, I changed yeah. my behavior. No, yeah. I didn't go on ski trips and do dangerous things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. Okay. As I, as I predicted, the hour went by very, very fast. <laughs> um, okay. So the books, here is the manufactured book uh, that I <laughs> Steve Fuller, Back to the University's Future. When is it coming out, by the way, Steve? Do you know? um, at the end of the summer. End of the summer, sometime August? Yep. Augustish. And then this this baby here. Yeah, as well. well um, thanks guys, for me. Great thank discussion. You. Yeah. Thank you so much, as, as always. Thank you both. Yeah, guys. Yeah, no, this is a lot of fun. <laughs> it's okay, guys. A lot of fun. Thanks a lot. Uh, Till next time. time. Till next Righto. time. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Take care. You've been listening to Humanity 8.0 with your host, Dr. Ahmed Bouzid, founder and CEO of Witlingo. Brought to you by Rokos. Thanks for listening.